All right, so now we're moving on again to yet another locality. Quite, quite, uh, we seem to be jumping around the world quite erratically. Solid yeah, all right. So now we're off to the, the Russian Far East, uh, and uh, yeah, a few volcanoes there. That could be fun. One or two. Yeah. All right, I'm the last talk. So thanks everybody for still being here. And if there's any good news, it's that I will show you hardly any graphs at all. Um, although at this point, I suspect everybody just wants to see landscape photos and I have hardly any of those also. All right, so at this conference, there's been a lot of discussion of sources of error and TEFRA analysis and so on. I'm coming at this from the perspective that you've all worked it all out and that I can, I can just assume that there are no issues and take it from there. So here is an example of field applications of tephra chronology in an archaeological context on the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. So I'm going to talk about an archaeological survey that focuses on a collection of Holocene archaeological sites um, on, wow, that totally got washed. Oh, no, you can see it. I can't see it on the screen. Kamchatka Peninsula. Everybody sort of knows where that is. Um, this is, confusingly, the Kamchatsky Peninsula, which is on the Kamchatka Peninsula. And it is a seismically dynamic region. There are a lot of faults. There are a lot of earthquakes. There are a lot of volcanoes. The two closest volcanoes that we've got are Kluchevskoy and Shevelich. Um, Tefra from Kluchevskoy sort of misses our area. Shevelich dumps on us on a regular basis. So this is an ideal example of what we would encounter as archaeologists looking at Tefra in the field you can see a lot of beautiful bands of ash, volcanic ash, and then you have some cultural soils as well. There's wood ash, there's charcoal, there's artifacts. Um, and our cultural layers are bracketed nicely by those tephra layers. So those are the cultural soils. Um, under ideal circumstances, we're also working with people, uh, geologists, volcanologists, tephrachronologists, who have accurately dated those tephra layers and can tell us exactly what we're looking at. It helps to work side by side with geologists who are merrily digging trenches to get nice representative stratigraphic profiles in the nearest peat bog. Um, so this actually happened to be the case on this, this project, which was great. And then it helps to have Vera Ponomareva tell you exactly what is in your test unit. <laughs> um, so in this case, you can see that we've got uh, the recent, fairly recent 1964 AD Chevelich ash fall on the top. There's a couple of other sort of nondescript ones in there. Um, we've got the Xudach 1, which we have in vast quantities. It is not a cryptotephra in our area. Um, and uh, another Chevelich eruption um, called Chevelich Dvoinoi, which serves as a pretty useful marker tephra in the area. So, in an area like this, maybe I'll just back up a second. Um, having a well-studied and well-dated TEFRA sequence is an essential tool, really, when you're doing archaeological survey. Because when you're doing an archaeological survey, you're covering a vast amount of ground, um, usually with a handful of people, and you need to rapidly be able to tell if a site, basically, first of all, how old the site is. As an archaeologist, the first question you ask when you find artifacts or the remains of a dwelling is, how old is this? Because then you can sort the entire area into a rough chronology. You can decide which archaeological sites you want to focus your energy on because you can't excavate everything. 
um, and you can answer whichever important research questions you have. If you're interested in changes in um, changes in technology over time, then you can look at an old site, a medium site, and a young site and look at the artifacts. If you're interested in changes in how, how people interacted with the environment, you can look at environmental change in a pollen core, and you can look at changes in settlement patterns over time based on how old those sites are. So we need to know how old the sites are, and we need to know quickly. Because like you all, and possibly we may be even, we may be the least well-funded, maybe cultural anthropologists are less well-funded than we are, um, but typically people think that 10, 20,000 bucks is, that's good enough, right? You don't need any more than that. So with our $20,000, what are we gonna do? We're gonna take your Tefra chronology, I don't care how bad you think it is, we're gonna use it like a hammer and we are going to hit everything in sight. <laughs> so we did a survey. Um, in this survey, we identified 60 archaeological sites in three field seasons between 2009 and 2011. Um, so the, because of the density of surface vegetation in this area, the, the best indicators of archaeological sites are the presence of depressions on the ground surface. And they group into three major categories of depressions. which I will talk about later, <laughs> excuse me. Um, at 30 of these sites, we were able to excavate test pits in order to identify the material culture um, and get a very precise chronology and a very precise idea of what people were actually doing in those areas. Um, in the other 30, there wasn't time, and so we used uh, my old friend, the Oakfield auger, to take a quick stratigraphic core and just basically, is there a cultural soil? Yes. Is there a tephra? Yes. What does that tephra look like? Okay, moving on. So here we have Xudach 1. Here we have a cultural layer above it. Um, we've got a nice Chevelich above that. And below Xudach, we have another cultural layer. Yes, I know, we should do glass analysis, but it's Xudach, let me tell you. Okay, now I'll tell you about the different types of site. So the early sites, the oldest occupations, were dated to 6,100 calibrated years ago. Um, and these earliest sites, they're not identifiable from surface features. They're, they exist just below newer sites that were basically dug into the old sites. Some areas people just really like to live in, and they lived in there over and over again. Now, there are a set of sites from 5,500 5, to 3,000 years calibrated ago. And they're visible on the surface, like this one. But you can't see it because it's a very shallow depression. I'm sitting in it. It goes there. Trust me, I was there. Um, and these sites, they represent seasonal camps, basically. Um, People would move from one area to another, another, depending on what's in season. They would set up a temporary camp, probably a tent of some sort, and they would, you know, catch fish, harvest berries, etc. cetera. Um, it's interesting to note that during this early period, you can't see it from our area, but outside of the area, people were moving down river valleys closer and closer to the coast. So you have a shift in where people were living over time and we're going to see sort of an extreme example of that at the end here. Hello. There we go. All righty. Oh, there's one other cool thing, right. So, the circle. Um, during the earliest phase, the beach ridges, which later closed off which it, what is now near Peachnia Lake, um, the beach ridges did not exist. Around 4,500 years ago, there was an earthquake, which has been dated. Faults have been excavated, and the tephras have been dated. And so there was an earthquake, there was seismic uplift, 
and beach ridges began to form. This became an enclosed lagoon. Um, it was no longer a purely saltwater environment. And we've done some reconstruction of that paleo coastline. We used a digital elevation model that was already widely available. And we used paleo environmental and geomorphological data from peat excavations around the area to reconstruct where the shorelines would have been at different points in time. So, moving on to the latest period, these depressions are huge. This person is in a depression. It's a foundation of what would have been a house. Um, the superstructure is gone. You just have what was basically dug out beneath it. And you can't miss those in the landscape. Even if you can't see them from a distance, you basically fall into them when you're walking into them. And these are large, permanent coastal sediments, sediments, settlements, um, where people were actually living for much of the year, certainly during the winter months, which would have been awful. Um, and associated with these are seasonal camps near major salmon spawning rivers and lakes. So sort of like in the Pacific Northwest, salmon were a major resource and people lived where they could get at them because salmon are delicious. Um, these depressions are so deep that you can in fact see them in Google Earth. This is the site of Kultuk. And in this area, I know they're there so it's more obvious to me, but there's smudges. <laughs> there are dark smudges. Those dark smudges are all house depressions. All right, so let's go back to our idealized test pit, which is a real test pit, and I was very happy to see it. So the landscape was seismically and volcanically active. Despite this, people kept living there. They didn't bail out. Why? That's one of our questions. Um, you can see here the dip in the stratigraphy. This is an old hearth pit, an old fireplace, basically. These are all wood ash layers. And the tephras have then filled in in between, but then above that, people built another fire, another series of fires. Another tephra fell on top of that. So here are all of the tephras that we have available to us in this pit. Um, these numbers are round, rounded numbers representing the uncalibrated radiocarbon dates for those different layers. SH is Chevelich, KS1 is Ksudach1. Um, Chevelich is a, an eager contributor to the tephra collection in the area. And then that massive Ksudach1 eruption um, is several centimeters thick. Um, we also have actual calibrated dates, but putting the ranges in interferes with our shorthand, so we go with the, uh, the, the rounded uncalibrated when we're talking about them. So in this archaeological site, we don't have any data about the above ground structure. Um, we don't know if there would have been a permanent roof. If there was, how did all that tephra get in? One hypothesis is that it was uh, a seasonal structure that could have been disassembled, taken down like a tent or a teepee, moved to another place. Tephra could have fallen in the interim. They come back the next year, they set it up. Tephra gets trampled into the floor. Um, if you look at the profile, in fact, in those cultural layers, you see the remains of several tephras that have just been sort of mixed in. One of them is right here. This is the Chevelich Devoinoi, I, I think, I believe, because it is missing from the sequence and it should be in there. And because it is tan and sandy, very fine grained, like Chevelich Devoinoi should be. And because we have charcoal from an archeological feature, the, the hearth associated with that, that corresponds basically exactly to the time period of Chevelich Devoinoi. So basically what happened here, the tephra fell um, into this person's house. They were probably annoyed, 
but they moved on with their lives and they just got incorporated into the floor as they walked around. So one question I have is we don't currently have data on the time of year that the sites were occupied. Um, but I have a feeling that if a tephra fell during the winter months when people were living off of stored food, it wouldn't have impacted their lives as much as if it fell, let's say, in the early spring when they were, had run through their stores and they were absolutely desperate to get out there and start hunting and gathering. So we see this pattern repeated through the area. Here's sample stratigraphy from a couple of different sites, Kultuk and Izvlisti. You can see cultural material, tephra, cultural material, tephra, cultural material, tephra, cultural material, tephra. Um, and in all locations, the ash fall did not trigger any sort of abandonment until, what do you know, Ksudach 1. Not everywhere, but in certain places, you see the cultural material disappear after Xudach 1. So here are a couple of isopac maps. This is Shevelich for a couple of eruptions that produced useful marker tephras. Um, you can see that they blow, they're sort of localized, and they blow basically just on the Kamchatsky Peninsula, um, typically sparing the neighboring areas. Uh, most of these tephras, when you look at them in the profile, they're like one or two centimeters thick. Not, not nothing, but they're not massive either. So one thought is that if there were environmental and social impacts of ashfall, people could have mitigated that by just moving a little bit. Maybe they had neighbors down the coast. Maybe they could move in to the river valley. No big deal, right? Then you get Xudach 1. Um, this was a big eruption, and it left a massive ash fall everywhere, huge plume, covered half of the Kamchatka Peninsula. Clearly, fragments of tephra are showing up, you know, in North America and further abroad. And in fact, in, on the Kamchatsky Peninsula, um, the tephra lies as much as 10 centi well, five centimeters thick now, and the idea is that it would have been about 10 centimeters thick when it actually hit the ground. So that's, that's significant. And it covered such a large area that people would not have been able to move away in order to cope with it. They would have had to stay put and deal with it. And so we have an example of what some of the environmental impacts were from Xudach 1. We have a pollen profile. Um, this will be published. It is not yet published. And you can see right around the time that Xudach 1 happened, you have a massive hit to the tree population, a massive hit to the shrub population, Um, except for a couple of sort of unique exceptions. And you have grasses doing pretty well. So basically, you have a huge environmental shift from a forested landscape to a very open grassy landscape. Um, and this, understandably, would have affected anybody who was used to hunting and gathering plants in the woods of Kamchatka. And in fact, what we see is that only a fraction of the archaeological sites surveyed actually have occupations after the Xudach eruption. However, that doesn't mean that everybody died. What happened is that they all consolidated into large villages. There was already a trend towards larger, more permanent structures. There was already an economic shift towards actually dependence on marine resources and not terrestrial resources. 
And then if you map the patterns of the archeological sites, you can see that instead of being sort of scattered seasonal camps, you end up with very concentrated settlements. So our hypothesis is that this eruption, it basically hastened a shift that was already taking place um, and it triggered the consolidation of this maritime lifestyle um, and this move away from a terrestrial based economy. And that wasn't something that we had seen with the earlier volcanic eruptions. So, in conclusion, I propose that the efforts of you all are absolutely essential to this type of archaeological research. And actually, at the same time, we as archaeologists are often in a place, places where you guys aren't. Um, it just so happened that we were working together geologists and archaeologists on this one particular project, we're frequently digging holes in things that you would not think to dig holes in. Um, we'll dig holes in almost anything, in fact. And so we can, at the same time, collect data that will be useful for you once we've agreed on you know, a set of standard terminology, which is what's going to come out of this, right? So in conclusion, I leave you with Shevelich. <laughs> erupting. Um, I got, I was privileged to watch, apparently it's not that much of a privilege because Chevelich is always erupting, but um, that's old Chevelich, which doesn't do anything anymore, and young Chevelich, which is constantly spitting stuff out, and the geological team, and the logistical advice that we could not have done this without. Thank you very much. Do, do you see that same cultural shift in other places that weren't affected by uh, those eruptions well, at about the same time? Hello, um, because we weren't, basically our survey area was completely within that zone and so we weren't able to make a comparison. That would be the best test of the hypothesis that people used to deal with it by moving out of the way until the, the calamity happened. Um, however, this is also part of a larger, the International Comparative Circumpolar Archaeological Project also looked at sites of similar age in um, James Bay in Quebec and also the northern coast of the Gulf of Botnia in Finland. And there, James Bay not so much, but there is a trend towards increasing consolidation of settlement and permanence of settlement even in the absence of eruptions. Um, so, yeah, you, do, you can see that, in fact, in the absence of eruptions. Yes. And the uh, hearths, do you find what sort of other cultural evidence do you find in those stone pits? tools? Um, you, yeah. We find a lot of stone tools, and we find carbonized bone and bits of shell. Um, we don't find as much like wood or bone tools as we think we should, and there are clearly issues with preservation because. Our understanding is that a lot of the tools would have been made from wood and bone in that area. I think that's a very neat story. I love to see cases of human resilience. Um, but I was struck by your pollen diagram because it's a percentage pollen diagram and I noticed there was an increase in aquatics at the time which would automatically push down the, the percentages, potentially, of the other taxa. 
So just be careful about how I would interpret what's happening in that pollen diagram. I do not want to make any firm statements <laughs> because I was sent the Florin sent me the diagram and then went into the field. Um, so <laughs> I wasn't able to grill him on the details. I can put you in touch with him if you want. I thought it was kind of interesting to see uh, what looked like the same fire pit potentially being used repeatedly for like a couple thousand years or so, you know, give or take. It was insane. <laughs> Trust me. No, we, we excavated it down. It, it changed shape over time. So the earliest version was this round thing in the corner, and the latest version was this very oval, long thing. But it was just... So clearly there were, like, architectural changes over time, but, but the... Loc it's crazy. You would never... I would never, I would never even know where my grandmother had built a fire pit. Like, much less like my great 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 grandmother. I mean, it's right unless it's there was no insane. interruption. Unless there's no interruption. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, is there any evidence for what the houses looked like before the Russians got to Kamchatka, and you can compare that to? the remnants of the houses that you see in the archaeological sites? There are early historic descriptions, um, not before the, from the Russians. I mean, they were sort of the folks who, who gave us the early descriptions. Um, and they are architecturally very similar to the, the latest period sites. I mean, it, we use that as sort of our ethnographic analogy for the latest period sites. Um, the early periods are just a, a mystery at this point. Thanks. We got, oh, we do have one. Ah. <laughs> Sneaking up behind me. <laughs> um, is there any evidence that the tephras were um, beneficial, that they changed the soil to make them better, or that they provided some sort of resource? There is uh, research evidence not done by us and not in this area that tephras, I mean, tephra fall can have beneficial as well as negative effects. It can add nutrients to the soil. It can add nutrients to the watershed. Um, so what we need really is a, a chemical analysis to see if phosphorus could have been added to the soil, um, iron, other nutrients that plants would have liked to use to grow. <laughs>